on this computer. Okay, I think I did it and I didn't need any reminders. Um, so before we, we jump into things, I'll go through our agenda for the day. Um, so we'll start things off by chatting a bit about um, Muskoka Conservancy. Um, if you haven't heard about us before, this is your first time joining. Um, and then we'll chat a bit about what an owl is exactly, how to identify the owls that you'll find in Muskoka, whether they're here year round or just passing through. We'll also talk about some of the threats to owls and things that you can do to help. Um, as well as some tips and tricks on how to find owls um, in your backyards or the next time you're visiting um, an area. So throughout, um, throughout our webinar today, I may have a couple questions for you guys as well. So feel free to unmute yourselves and shout out any answers, um, or you can type them in the chat. But again, I'll, I'll try to do my best at monitoring everything. Um, again, and also if you have any questions, feel free to ask questions um, as we go, and there'll also be a period for questions at the end. Um, so feel free to save your questions until then, or you can ask them as you think of them as well. Um, so does anyone have any questions before we get started? Check the chat again. I think we're all good to go. So here we go. Some background about the conservancy. If my slide will change. Okay, there we go. A little slow, but we got it. Um, so Muskoka Conservancy is a charity organization. Um, we are a land trust, the land trust of Muskoka, and we've been around since 1987, so for about 35 years. Um, and we work to protect and conserve the natural environment of Muskoka, whether it's wetlands, forests, meadows, shoreline, we're trying to protect it all. Um, our first protected nature reserve um, was J.P. McVitie on Eileen Gowan in Lake Muskoka, and it does have a public trail on it. So if you want to check it out, you can go ahead and paddle out to it or take your boat to it. Um, through generous donations, as well as grants that we've been able to receive, we're currently protecting 49 different properties across Muskoka, and this includes 3,758 acres of land um, and almost 60,000 feet of uh, sensitive shoreline, as well as 674 acres of wetland. Um, some of the properties are accessible, like the one on Eileen Gowan. Um, they have trails and some have access points, but most are actually closed to the public and they're only accessible um, through expert guided hikes that's a part of our Nature Quest series. So some of you may have been on a Nature Quest hike before. Um, as a charity, we are supported by members, um, as well as an awesome and amazing group of volunteers, including our volunteer board of directors. Um, so we, we couldn't do it without our volunteers and members. And we thank everyone who, who helps us out and those who are just joining along to, to attend hikes and webinars as well. So thank you, everyone. Um, today is also a very, very special day. Today is Giving Tuesday. Um, so this is an event that's celebrated annually on the Tuesday following American Thanksgiving, um, which also includes Black Friday and Cyber Monday. It's a global movement of generosity and giving back, and it encourages people to give back to their communities um, and make a difference. So we always encourage people to, to donate if they can or help out in whatever way they can on this day. And if you decide you'd like to donate to Muskoka Conservancy, you can donate through our website, uh, which is down here at the bottom, muskokaconservancy.org. Um, we've got a button up on one of the corners that you can click to donate, or you can call our amazing admin assistant, Emily, at the phone number here, 705-645-7393, uh, and her extension is 201. Um, and with a donation of $95 or more, you can actually become a member. And you can also donate monthly. So if you donate, I think it's like seven or eight dollars a month, you'd become a member as well. So um, those are some things you can do. We also understand that not everyone can give back um, or donate a monetary amount. Um, so other ways to give back include becoming a volunteer or participating in webinars like you are today, and just always continuing to share your love and your knowledge of nature and do what you can to, to help our ecosystem. So any donations you make to the Conservancy will help with acquisition of environmentally significant land, um, which includes the protection of our wetlands, lakes, forests, rock barrens, meadows, all of our amazing ecosystems. 
which will therein protect our species at risk um, plants and animals like our landings turtle, which is down here. Um, and it will also help with uh, stewardship activities on the land as well. Um, so yeah, that's my little blurb on Giving Tuesday. Hopefully everyone has a good Giving Tuesday. Um, but now we'll get back into our main, our main interest, our main event for today, um, which is what is an owl? Um, so an owl is a bird of prey or a raptor. Um, that's essentially what they're known as. They're a predator and a carnivore, um, which means they feed on smaller birds, mammals, reptiles, insects, um, you name it pretty much. Whatever's smaller than them, they'll eat it. They're usually um, a nocturnal or crepuscular species um, or type of animal, and occasionally they're diurnal. So you may have heard, you've probably all heard of nocturnal before. I know what that means. It means they're active at night. Um, diurnal is the opposite of that, if you haven't heard of that before, which means they're active during the day. So very few owls are actually active during the day. Um, and most of them are also crepuscular, which is those in between times between nighttime and daytime. So it means they're most active at dusk and dawn hours. Um, so that's a little bit of background about owls, um, but they're also really great night hunters. So now we'll explore some of the really unique characteristics that make them such good night hunters. So the first thing is that they have um, silent flight actually. So most, um, most other birds, you might recall walking through a forest and hearing a raven or a crow fly by and you can hear the flapping of their wings. Um, but owls actually have make basically no sound when they're flying. They have silent flight. Um, so how exactly does this work? How are they able to manage that? So they actually have very large wings in proportion to their body size. So if you take a look at this owl, you can see the wings, the length of the wings makes up almost like more than half of their body length. Um, and by having these large wings, they're able to actually flap their wings slower and less often um, because they can still get places pretty quickly by just making fewer flaps of their wings, um, which helps to make them uh, make less noise essentially. Um, each feather on their wing um, at the top or leading edge has actual comb-like, you can sort of see it looks like a comb, um, serrations on it. And then the bottom edge or the trailing edge has a sort of fringe and frayed um, edge to it. So by having these um, frayed and serrated edges, it actually helps to break up the turbulent air that's um, created when they're flapping their wings and it absorbs the sound. Um, so amazingly enough, they've got silent flight. Um, and so we ask ourselves, why? Why do they have this characteristic anyways? Um, and no one actually really knows for sure. It hasn't been scientifically confirmed or anything. Um, but what makes sense is that if they have silent flight, their prey can't hear them coming to catch them. Um, and it also allows them to hear better when they're hunting as well. The next characteristic um, of owls that is quite unique is they have really excellent vision. Um, so they actually don't have the characteristic eyeballs like us that are perfectly round, but their eyes are actually more tubular shaped. Um, and they actually take up most of the space in their skull. So I think the comparison is if our eyes were the size of oranges, that's sort of the size that an owl's eye would be in their head, which is pretty big. Um, but by having these uh, really big eyes that are tube shaped, um, they actually are able to have binocular vision, which gives them really excellent depth perception um, and the ability to see things in their environment. Their eyes also actually can't move around like ours do if we look around, um, but they're held in place with sclerotic rings, which is a part of their skull. Um, so they can't move them around. And that's why you see them moving their entire head around um, because they need to in order to look around. Um, so they can't actually turn their head all, all of the way around, um, which many people think they can do, but they can turn their head about 270 degrees. So it's still, still much further than us humans can do. And that's actually because they have 14 um, vertebrae in their, in their neck. So they have actually double what humans have and able to turn their head. 
Um, they also have very large eyes that allow them to take in enough light to be able to see in the dark. And they have a reflective layer behind their retina, which is called the tapetum lucidum, which actually helps to amplify images um, when they're looking in the dark. They also have a nictating membrane, which you can see on this little young owl here, um, which is a second eyelid that they can close over their eyes when they're flying to help avoid getting debris and other things flying into their eyes. Uh, so there are a lot of other more scientific um, really in-depth things that give them really great vision as well, but we won't go, go too in-depth with that today. And um, these are just a few of the things that really help them have excellent vision. So in addition to their excellent vision, they actually have even better uh, hearing. So you might think that after all that, that their, their vision is like superb, it's the best thing about them, but their hearing is actually what helps them hunt even more. Um, so how this works is that their ears are actually positioned asymmetrically on their head. So generally our ears are right across from each other, um, but theirs are sort of off and, and set back from each other. So you can see this, this is the ear here, um, is set further back and higher up. Um, and this one is lower on this side. And so how this works is the sounds that prey are making under the snow will actually reach their ears at different times. Um, therefore, they can sort of triangulate and do all these calculations in their head based on when the sound is reaching their ears to determine um, where exactly, they can exactly pinpoint um, their prey underneath the snow and find out where it's coming from, which is really cool. They also have a facial disc, which you can see here, um, most of the owls that you see, you can really see their facial disc and their ears are located right about in here beside the eye. Um, and the facial disc actually helps to funnel um, sounds and guide sounds right into the ear openings um, to help them hear really well. So they're, they're pretty cool and amazing animals to, to have this excellent hearing. So those are some of the very unique things that make them really good at hunting, but the interesting facts go on and on for owls. So we'll cover a bit more here. Um, so unlike other birds, most owls actually have feathers on both their legs and their feet. So if you look at a hawk or a raptor or just any other songbird, they've just got scaly, scaly feet. But owls will actually have feathers that cover um, their feet and legs, which helps to keep them warm, especially for a lot of our northern climate owls. The average lifespan is about five to 12 years but it depends on a lot of conditions in the environment as well as species. Um, but generally they will live about five to 12 years. Breeding generally begins in the first half of the year. Um, so you'll usually start hearing them calling a lot um, at the beginning of the year and then they start breeding into early spring. But again, it depends on the species. Um, some will actually call year round while others only call during that breeding period to find mates and mark their territories. Um, but some species um, that sort of stay in the same areas year round will, will call the entire time. Um, additionally, owls are generally monogamous, so they'll mate for life, um, but occasionally in <laughs> years where there's abundant prey and a lot of resources um, and they're having a really healthy, healthy year, um, they might actually breed with multiple partners just because they have the capacity to do that that year and produce more offspring. Um, and lastly, although there are many more fun facts as well, um, some owl species will prey on other smaller owls. Um, so believe it or not, the uh, only predator or one of the only predators for the barred owl is actually the great horned owl. Um, so it's a little sadistic that way, but um, they've got to do what they have to do to survive. So. Um, so here's my first question for you guys. So feel free to put it in the chat or unmute yourselves. Um, but I'm going to ask you guys, how many owls do you think live in Muskoka? Um, and not just owls that are here year round, but also the owls that might uh, might make their way in here during um, migration or the winter season. So does anyone have any guesses? I'll check the chat. Jude says six. Any other guesses?
Joanne and Clark think eight. Okay, anyone else? I'm looking for at least one more guess. Come on, guys. <laughs> Another six. Okay, you guys are actually not, not quite there. There's actually nine species that live in Muskoka, um, most of which are here year round, but a few of them only really come in this, um, this far south when it's um, the winter season. So good guesses. Thank you everyone for participating. Um, so now we'll get into the unique species that we have. Um, so I'm going to go over their appearance, um, what their call sounds like, um, as well as their habitat and distribution, and then I'll let you guys know what they are, but of course I'll get you guys to, to guess first. Um, so this owl is one of our large owls. They grow um, usually about 43 to 50 centimeters in height. All of them have round heads, <laughs> pretty much. Um, but only some have ear tufts or horns. So this species does not have any ear tufts. Um, they are brown and white, um, modeling all over with bars on the chest and stomach. And they're one of the few owls that have really dark, almost black eyes. Um, so their call sounds like who cooks for you. And I will play it, although I know Zoom sometimes has some issue with recordings and playing things. So Unfortunately, you might not be able to hear it, but hopefully you guys can. I was practicing yesterday and it didn't seem to be working too great for all of the calls. Um, but if not, I will send you guys the links to the calls um, at the end of our, our meeting. So let's see if you can hear it. So that's what this owl sounds like. So some of you most likely have heard this guy before. Um, the habitat that these, uh, this species prefers include mature forests, swamps, streams, um, and open areas. And usually they prefer um, forests with hemlock, maple, oak, um, beech, aspen, white spruce, quaking aspen, and balsam poplar. Um, so does anyone know what this species is? Let me check the chat. Jude says barred owl, you got it. Hopefully everyone else got that one too. This is our barred owl. So one of the more common species that uh, you'll see around Muskoka and across Ontario as well. So here is our next species. Um, this is another very large owl, um, usually between 46 and 63 centimeters in height. Again, rounded head, they all have round heads. It's very cute. Um, and this guy has prominent ear tufts or horns. So they um, generally have gray and brown modeling all over um, and their face um, is red, reddish brown, sort of cinnamony color with a white patch on the throat, which is a little bit more difficult to see in this uh, photo. Um, and they have bright yellow eyes. So I think all of the rest of the owls um, that live in Muskoka have these bright yellow eyes. And this is what their call sounds like. A very characteristic, when you think of an owl, this is what you think of. So that's that one. Um, the habitat for this species includes coniferous, deciduous, and mixed forests. So essentially all of the forests that could be out there. Um, usually um, forests that are secondary growth. And they'll also be found in swamps and orchards and fields and other open areas, um, such as wetlands and again, fields. Um, I think I forgot to cover the distribution for the barred owl, but, but it's a North American owl. Um, and for the, um, this owl here, they're found again in North America and in parts of South America as well. So does anyone know what this species is? Great horns, good job, Jude. He knows his owls for sure. <laughs> so hopefully you guys were able to guess that one as well. And there we go. Okay, so this next species is one of our very small and very cute species of owl growing only to about uh, 16 to 25 centimeters in height. Um, they have pointed ear tufts, just like the great horned owl, um, and they have variable color so they can um, have actually different morphs of color. So 
Um, they can be gray or they can be more brown or they can be red as well. Um, and generally in any of those color morphs, they'll have white modeling and bands and different spots and things. And again, they have yellow eyes as well. Their call is an even pitch trill, which descends into a whinny, which sounds exactly like a horse. So hopefully you guys can hear it here. So hopefully you guys could hear that, but I know yesterday when I was testing things, the higher pitched ones seemed to be a little bit more difficult to hear, um, but hopefully you guys heard that. Um, the habitat for this species is pretty much everywhere. They're found in lots of different various habitats, um, forest, open areas, um, and they're especially usually close to urban areas as well. So you'll see them in cities pretty often. Um, and as long as it's a forest that has lots of tree cavities with dead standing trees, um, you'll find them there because those are really great spots for the species to nest. And again, um, they're a primarily North American um, species of owl. So does anyone know what this one is? I see a message in the chat. Screech owl. There are actually a few different species of screech owl though, and this one specifically is our eastern screech owl. So you can see it's mainly found in eastern North America. There we go. Next, we have another one of our very small uh, species of owl. Um, so this one is generally between 18 and 21 centimeters in height. It has, again, a large round head, um, lacking ear tufts for this one. Um, its back and head is mottled brown and white, and it's got these prominent white eyebrows you can see over the yellow eyes. Um, and its belly and chest is white and cinnamon streaked. Um, so very cute there. Its um, call is a high pitch 222 whistle, um, but a little bit better than my reenactment there. So hopefully you guys could hear that. Um, the habitat that's preferred for this species includes mature forests with an open understory for hunting. And usually um, you'll find them in deciduous trees when they're nesting and coniferous trees when they're roosting and sleeping during the day. And they generally prefer areas that have river habitat nearby as well. Um, and as you can see, again, they're a North American species of owl. So does anyone know what this uh, cute little guy is? The Sawat Owl, correct. Uh, so this is our Northern Sawat Owl. There we go. Okay, so next we have another uh, medium-ish sized owl, generally between 36 and 45 centimeters in height. Um, it's got no ear tufts um, that are found on this guy. Um, it's got a whitish gray face with that very prominent black border and little black eyebrows as well. Um, its back is brown with white spots and its belly and chest um, has those brown, uh, really tight horizontal stripes on it. Um, and it's got a slow rolling whistled trill for its call. So it's quite different than the, uh, the characteristic owl hooting that you're, you might be familiar with. Um, its habitat includes open coniferous or mixed forests um, bordered by open areas um, and marshes. So it, it's sort of right, um, right in between, its range goes right to in between where Muskoka is. So um, it may be found in here, but it may also not be, and it may just be coming down during the winter um, seasons when it needs to, um, but there's a chance that it could be around here. So does anyone know what this species is? The Northern Hawk Owl, yes, you got it. Um, this is our 
northern hawk owl. There we go. Seems to be a bit finicky, but that's okay. Um, this next species is very, very large, um, between 61 and 84 centimeters in height. Uh, it's got no ear tufts as well. Um, it's generally silvery gray all over um, with different gray, brown, and white markings and streakings. Um, it's got two arcs between the eyes that form almost an X, as you can see here, and a white bow tie with a black center under the chin. Um, so those are some things to help you identify this guy. And again, yellow eyes. Um, its call is a low-pitched and short woo. Um, so it sounds pretty similar to a characteristic owl's owl call. So let's listen to it here. There we go. Um, so the habitat of this species is generally dense, wet, coniferous forests in the far north. Um, as you can see in its range, it's got a very far north range that, again, just sort of touches Muskoka. Um, they generally hunt in meadows and bogs and other open areas. Um, and like I said, rare to Muskoka, um, but they may winter here if population uh, of rodents is high and they've got lots of resources available for them. Uh, so does anyone know what this species is? Great, great owl, you got it. And I see your message here, Elizabeth, about the calls. Yeah, unfortunately, there seems to be an issue with Zoom that it doesn't want to pick up all of the calls when they're they're being played. Um, but I'll make sure that I send them to everyone so you can listen to them at home. But I'm sorry that it's not not working out the best right now. Um, but hopefully, you'll be able to hear them through the links that I send. And yeah, this is our great gray owl. So good job. Here we go. Okay, so this is another one of our medium owls, um, generally between 35 and 40 centimeters in height. It's got very long um, ear tufts that are black, um, brown, and buff with a bit of white as well. Um, it's got an orange cinnamon face, and it's got these vertical white lines um, between the eyes. It's generally black, um, brown, and buff with white patterning. And again, it's got yellow eyes. Um, this one makes a series of 10 to 200, yep, 200 who um, notes, which are generally spaced out by two to four seconds. So I won't play you a call that has all 200, especially since you're not hearing them very well, um, but hopefully you guys can hear this one. <laughs> Okay, so that's this species call. Um, and as you can see, um, it likes to roost in dense vegetation, uh, like the guy pictured here. Um, and generally, it'll forage in open grasslands and shrublands and open forests. Um, and here's its range map. Um, so it's generally found in North America. Does anyone know, have any guesses for this species? The long-eared owl, yes. So this one um, is easy to remember because it's got those really long ear tufts. So remember that next time if you see this, this guy out in the wild. There we go, long-eared owl. Okay, our next owl here is another medium owl, generally between 34 to 43 centimeters in height. Um, believe it or not, it has short ear tufts, which as you can see in this photo, are quite rarely ever seen. Um, its back is brown um, with all of these white slash buff um, spots on it. Um, its breast and belly is um, pale white um, with these brown streaks. And it's got, again, bright yellow eyes that are really accentuated by um, this dark black um, outline around them. So, um, their call is a series of several really quick hoots, um, but males and females will also bark and whine and scream and make a bunch of other vocalizations. Um, 
this species rarely actually calls, so you don't hear it too often, um, and there aren't actually too many recordings of it out there. Um, but generally, you won't really hear it. But if you do, this is what it'll sound like. <laughs> And then you probably heard some other birds in there too, because again, there aren't many, many good recordings of this species out there. Um, in terms of its habitat, it really enjoys um, large open areas um, with really short vegetation. So this includes meadows and prairies and um, tundra savanna and marshes. Um, and its habitat is all across North America as well as it's got some populations in South America as well. Um, does anyone have any guesses for this species? A personal favorite. Yeah, it's a very cute owl, like all of them. You can't really choose a favorite, um, but yeah, this is the short-eared owl. So good job again, Jude. Let's see if it, there we go. Okay, so this is our last owl, um, which doesn't live in Muskoka year round. It's only up um, in the tundra area. And it is another large owl between 52 and 71 centimeters in height. Um, again, it's got a round head and it's got rarely seen ear tufts as well, just like the short eared owl, but you can kind of see them above the eyes um, in these pictures. Um, these are one of the only species of owl that has really obvious sexual dimorphism as well, which means that um, the males and females look different. Um, so the males are completely white. Sometimes they'll have a few spots on them. And the females are white, but they've got all of these black and brown markings. And that's because they nest on the ground. So they need to blend in with the rocks and the, um, the vegetation of the tundra. Um, their call is low and raspy, and it's usually uh, two hoots at a time that you'll hear when they're calling. So this is what it sounds like. Hopefully you guys can hear it. Doesn't want to play for some reason this time. So that's that call. Um, <clears throat> and similar to what I was saying, their habitat is in the tundra. So there's no trees around and they really prefer these open spaces with rolling terrain. And when they do get this far south um, in Muskoka sometimes, um, you'll find them around fields or old airports um, and things like that where they've got lots of open space for, for hunting. And they are um, diurnal, so they're one of the few owls that's active during the day, and you can see them hunting, hunting around. Um, and you don't need to go at night, out at night to see them, which is nice. So does anyone have any guesses for this species name? The snowy owl, yeah, you got it. Awesome. Oh, it wants to play the call again. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, thank you guys for bearing with me through some of my technical difficulties here. Um, so now we'll chat a bit about what some of the threats are to owls and um, what things you can do to help. So one of the, the biggest threats is habitat loss and fragmentation. So Unfortunately, as more forests and areas are being cleared um, for development and other means, um, they're losing their habitat and their habitat is becoming fragmented as well. So um, areas that used to be um, connected and provide a corridor for them to follow um, throughout their habitat is being cut off, um, causing, causing issues and habitat loss for them. Another threat is actually pesticides. So, Unfortunately, um, the owl's favorite foods are generally ones that we all consider pests. So um, they like to eat a lot of different rodents, which we probably don't, don't enjoy having around our homes. Um, so sometimes when people will put out pesticides for rats or mice and other rodents, um, these um, rodents can actually carry that pesticide in their system for a couple days before they actually die. 
Um, so when they're still out and about and an owl spots them and decides, you know, that's going to be my next meal, the owl inadvertently consumes that pesticide. Um, so a few um, barred owls and other species have actually uh, passed away and died because of consuming um, rodents that had pesticides in their system. Um, so try to avoid putting out pesticides if you can. Um, another issue is road mortality. Um, so you might not think of this for, for owls since they're a species that, you know, is able to fly around. Um, but what happens is when humans throw food out of their car, um, even if it's just an apple core or a banana peel or something like that, which will break down, it will actually attract rodents, squirrels, mice, whatever, to the side of the road um, to eat on that food that you've thrown out your window. Um, and then when an owl comes by and says, oh, look at that tasty snack right out in the open, sometimes they'll swoop down um, across the road and get struck by vehicles. So a lot of um, owls and raptors and other birds of prey that end up in rehabilitation centers um, are actually hit by cars trying to, to catch rodents on the roadside. Um, so that's a, a thing to be mindful of. Um, and another threat is light pollution. Um, they're night hunters, they hunt in the dark. So when there's sources of light out, um, it can affect their ability to hunt at night. Um, but even though there's a few threats out there to owls that are not great, there's always different things that we can do um, to help. So if you're able to, um, you can leave standing dead trees on your properties. Um, these will provide excellent perching and hunting um, areas for them uh, looking for prey, as well as trees that have cavities and old woodpecker holes in them and things like that can provide great nesting opportunities for different owl species. You can also put up appropriate sized nest boxes. So a lot of um, bird species have sort of specific dimensions that they prefer for their their um, bird houses. So um, you could probably search up online um, what owl you're trying to attract and put up a nest box for them and they might just use it. Um, another thing you can do to help is to keep your cats and um, your cats inside and your dogs on leash. By keeping your cats inside, they're not um, feeding on, you know, the food source of owls um, and causing issues like that. And if you keep your dogs on leash when you're out on a walk in the forest, um, you can help uh, avoid them running off and potentially scaring an owl out of their, their habitat or their territory. So those are two other good things to practice. Um, like I mentioned, please don't throw food out of your car. I know we're, we're all guilty of it. We've done it at some point, but hopefully if you, you did not know before, now you've learned that even apple cores or any sort of fruit waste is not a great thing to throw out the window, even though it will decompose. Um, and lastly, keep off your lights um, if you can. It's a good practice for, for many reasons, as we know. So I'm just gonna check the chat. Yep, good comments there. <laughs> Not great things going on right now, um, but we'll chat about how to find some owls now. So um, if you, you want to go out and see some in your yard or in your favorite nature spot, here's some things to remember. So when you're trying to decide where to look, make sure you're looking in the habitat for the owl that you're trying to find. So um, generally it'll be a forest or nearby a field. Um, when to look, if you're looking during the day, um, you'll generally find owls roosting and sleeping in trees, generally in coniferous trees. At night, if you're going to take a look, um, or at dusk and dawn as well, you can look for them hunting, um, which is generally near open areas that you know there's lots of uh, prey activity around. Um, and if you're deciding to call owls to see if you can call them in or hear them, hear them calling back, um, some important things to remember are to stay quiet and try to keep your lights off um, to a minimum and to make sure you're starting with the smallest owls first. Um, that way you're avoiding scaring off the small owls if you're uh, playing a big predator owls call first. Um, and most importantly, you have to be respectful. So when you're doing this, um, you are irritating the owls a bit because you're, you're drawing them in and they're trying to defend their territory. Um, so really keep it to a minimum if you are are going to call in owls. It's a really fun experience and everyone should try to do it at least once um, to get the opportunity to hear or see an owl. 
Um, but just make sure you're not doing it every month or every week or too often um, and that you're being really respectful about it. Um, so yeah, those are my tips on how to find owls. And that was my last slide. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or you can um, unmute yourselves. And I put my contact information here as well um, in case you want to jot that down and you have any questions at a later point. So I'll open up the chat. And then if anyone has any questions, feel free to, to shout them out now. Thank you, Jude. And Philip said that they had a hawk owl on their road two years ago on South Month Drive. Wow, that's really cool. Hopefully they come back to visit this year and I'll, I'll go out to see them. <laughs> okay, does anyone have any questions at all about any of our owls or owl related things? Or even if it's not owl related and just nature related, I can do my, my, my best to answer any questions. Thank you, Joanne and Clark. Okay, I think we may not have any questions today. Thank you everyone for joining and please feel free to jot down the information here. Um, if you do have any questions at any point um, and Emily did note earlier in the chat that I did um, include the wrong extension for her. It's actually 200. So if you do um, want to, to call Emily at any point, it is 200. Um, we got a question about which owls are endangered. That's an excellent question. And I meant to mention it and totally forgot. So thank you very much for the reminder. Um, so we only have one um, species of owl that's at risk in Bracebridge. And that is actually the short-eared owl. Um, we do have the barn owl, which you can find in Ontario as well, which is at risk. Um, but its range doesn't come up to this far north in Ontario. Um, so we do have, I believe it's just the two owls that are species at risk. Um, and Joanne did know about the owl prowl. So um, we do have the owl prowl nature quest tomorrow. So if you've also signed up for that, um, we're going to be monitoring the weather because um, it's not, uh, not great weather in the forecast for tomorrow. Um, it's looking like there's going to be a lot of rain and then the potential um, for it to freeze in the afternoon, um, which is when we'd be planning on going out. So if you have registered for the nature quest tomorrow, keep an eye on your inboxes um, because you may have to reschedule or cancel for, for tomorrow. So thank you for the reminder, Joanne. Um, so Carol is asking which owls are most common in Muskoka. Um, the most common overall I have found is the barred owl, um, but screech owl and great horned owl are really common as well. Um, but it all sort of depends if you got to be in the right spot at the at the right time. Um, but I can't really speak to exactly which ones are most most common, um, except for the fact that the northern hawk owl and the great gray generally don't come this far south too often, but they do on occasion. So hopefully that answers your question. I think I went around the circle a little bit there. Um, and Carol here said that she put up an owl box last year, but no takers so far. Um, but hopefully I'll keep my fingers crossed for you that you will get one at some point. And yeah, we do have the nature quest tomorrow, bring chest waders and you'll, you'll, you'll probably make it out. <laughs> Anyone have any other last questions? I think we might be all good, but feel free to reach out if you ever have any questions. And thanks everyone so much for joining today. I hope you learned something new and had a good time and hopefully we'll see you at the next webinar as well. So thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day.